What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Alexander Leishman is the founder, chief executive officer, and chief technology officer at River Financial. Mr. Leishman brings his deep expertise in software engineering, information security, and Bitcoin to River, where he oversees investor relations, corporate strategy, and engineering. Prior to co-founding River Financial, Alex most recently served on the investment and engineering teams at Polychain Capital and Polychain Labs, focusing on Bitcoin-related venture investments. Alex has previously served as an engineer at Airbnb's security team, a management consultant for Deloitte, and first got deeply involved in the Bitcoin industry as an early engineer at MyCon, MyCoin, Taiwan, Taiwan's largest digital asset exchange. Alex holds a degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland and a master's in computer science from Stanford University, where he helped teach the first Bitcoin class. Alex, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm super excited to chat. Uh, you have quite a background. And um, I'm really curious, what, what did you think you were going to do when you were growing up? Uh, what was your dream job then? Or, you know, what were some of the dream jobs? Yeah, so, you know, once I was sort of old enough to sort of know what kind of careers, careers were out there, I, I actually had like one of, I think when I was in elementary school, um, they asked they were, there was something in class where they asked, what do we want to do? And I put down two answers. I put down aerospace engineer or chef. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, not a chef, um, not the worst cook in the world, but not, 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 not the best either. Um, chose a different path, uh, went and studied aerospace engineering in school, um, but uh, quickly went down the uh, economics rabbit hole and, and fell in love with Bitcoin, which set me on an entirely unexpected trajectory in life. Right. And uh, I mean, I'm kind of, uh, what was it like teaching the first Bitcoin class? Yeah, so um, I guess for, for context, I, so I had moved to the Bay Area um, a year after graduating undergrad. So I, I moved out to San Francisco in, at the end of 2013 um, to pursue a career as a Bitcoin engineer. And, and I worked out there for a few, about a year and a half, two years, um, working at a Bitcoin startup called MyCoin. And uh, ended up deciding I wanted to go back to grad school to um, bolster my computer science background because I, I wasn't a computer science undergrad. And um, so applied to Stanford, um, got in. And before I started, I um, found out that Dan Benet, the cryptography professor there, um, was planning to teach Bitcoin class. And so I emailed him, said, hey, I'm going to be, you know, in, in, uh, matriculating and, you know, as a grad student, um, and uh, would love to help, you know, TA the class. Um, and so back then, actually, there weren't very many, like, people in the CS department that, A, knew anything about Bitcoin, B, had any interest in it. And so um, I was actually one of the few students, especially in the grad program, who actually cared about it. And so it was a good fit. Um, there were a few other TAs um, and helped develop the course, helped develop some of the assignments, um, you know, work out some of the bugs in the first iteration of the class. And then uh, the class has been going on now for, for years, and it's one of the more popular classes in the computer science department at this point, given the rise of crypto since, since then. Um, so uh, back then, it was like AI was all the rage. I mean, it still is, but back then, like, you know, this class, it had good enrollment, but everyone, like everyone wanted to take all the ML classes. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think it, starting in 2017, you know, people really started wanting to take the, the crypto class. So right. Um, that was cool to see. And, and do you remember in the early days of this this class, um, you had known about Bitcoin, but what was maybe some of the impressions of people who had never heard of Bitcoin or, or did everyone come into the class or to hear about it? What was sort of the attitude around it or was there or the excitement level? Yeah, so, you know, it was very interesting seeing the a academia's interest in Bitcoin. Because the flavor of the interest was so dramatically different from what got me into Bitcoin. Um, in academia, the interest was from a technology perspective. Mm. And um, they really bought into the like, it's the blockchain that's interesting kind of thing. 
like sound money has was never something any computer science professor ever cared about right like right. i mean i don't sorry that's probably a too broad of a general I, I know what you're getting you know at what though I mean? that's not what drives them right um so so there was really none of that uh culture um in in the in the class you know as as the class is a great class but um it was purely technological so so um you know, s such a big part of why I cared about Bitcoin really wasn't something that a lot of students cared about either. Um, and that was like the biggest interesting thing for me. Um, you know, that said, I think it's great that they, that they teach it. Um, but um, that was sort of like the biggest adjustment uh, for me because I found, you know, when, 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 when all you can talk about is like the technology in Bitcoin without understanding like the higher level reason, um, it feels very myopic. Um, it feels mm. like you're missing like so much important context of like why this technology exists to begin with, um, the monetary aspects, the freedom aspects. And so that was, um, that was probably the, the, the sort of biggest surprise for me. Yeah, I, I, it's very interesting that you put it that way, especially around the technology side. I can really see that now, especially the way Silicon Valley and the sort of the VC class has seeded a lot of DeFi and ICOs and, and that kind of stuff, blockchain, et cetera. Whereas, you know, before you'd mentioned that, I was kind of excited about the idea of Stanford having this Bitcoin class and maybe the really smart people at Stanford getting it the way whatever you say about Google or Facebook, they, they kind of seeded, uh, I think they, you know, the founders of Google went to Stanford and I think the professors helped seed the company and, uh, you know, they really recognized the power of the algorithm there. And you, you kind of talked about that. Where, what, how did you come across Bitcoin and to what you mentioned before, like, why, why did you care? So um, what actually got me into Bitcoin um, wasn't an, wasn't really an interest in, in tech. Um, I, I, I went down the economics rabbit hole in college and started reading about, ended up reading, you know, about monetary policy and read the denationalization of money by Friedrich Hayek um, mm -hmm. and started this, like starting reading material, <laughs> sort of questioning the idea of central banking at all. And I had never been exposed to those ideas before. And I just became fascinated by this. I, and um, I had this goal of, you know, creating my own currency that the federal government couldn't control, private money, um, and building my own bank around my own private money. Um, and I, you know, I was like 20. I didn't know, I didn't know how I would accomplish that. Um, but the idea of it was cool. And so um, then in 2013, I was taking a Coursera class because I did want to beef up some of my programming skills. And Balaji Srinivasan, was teaching uh, a web engineering uh, Coursera class that I was taking in my free time mm -hmm. after work. And um, what the, the, there was an app assignment to build a donation page, um, a charity donation page using Bitcoin uh, for using the Coinbase API. And Coin, Coin, Coinbase had been around for maybe like a year at that point. And I was like, what, what is this? Like, what is this Bitcoin thing? I think I had heard about it like a year or two ago, but I, I, I didn't put the pieces together in my head. I was like, oh, okay, like whatever. And, um, and, and then I was like, sort of reading more about it, trying to like convince, like, like went to such a depth that I was like, I needed to convince myself this worked. Like I needed to convince mm -hmm. myself this was like, not some, you know, trivial, like, toy that just wasn't going to be around. Right. And I was like, you know, I think everyone's had that moment with Bitcoin and I was, I had my moment and I was like, oh my gosh, this, I started putting my pieces together. I was like, this fulfills the prophecy. And, um, like I have to work on this. This is amazing. This is going to totally change the world. And so, um, I, I had already been planning to leave, um, and move to the Bay area. Um, and um, this really sort of like gave me real purpose. And um, so, so by the end of 2013, I was like, I packed up my bags, moved to San Francisco. I didn't have a job lined up, but I know I wanted to work in Bitcoin. And um, uh, that was like the beginning of my Bitcoin story. And where does it go from there? Uh, you end up in San Francisco. I, I lived in San Francisco in 03, 04, maybe 04, 05. Uh, 
So uh, crazy town. Uh, you got no job. Where how does it all start from there? And and how do you end up? Yeah, yeah. where's it go from there? Um, so I had uh, I had uh, enrolled at a I enrolled at a programming boot camp, um, and uh, and and was crashing in a friend's place um, and uh, did this programming boot camp for like two months um, to just get the basics of programming sort of solidified and learn how web apps work. Um, it's like crash course and, uh, and, and sort of flavored sort of my focus around Bitcoin. And, and before I moved to San Francisco, I assumed everyone in San Francisco would care about Bitcoin mm -hmm. back then because online there was, there was a pretty vibrant community even back then. And I assumed like that would be the talk of the town. Like, of course, everyone sees that this is the most amazing thing in the world. Like, of course, when I get to San Francisco, everyone will be working on this. So I get there and like, no one cares. Um, and I'm like, okay. Like at first I was kind of bummed. I was like, mm -hmm. um, but I found the Bitcoin meetup and like, I found like the core of people who did care. Um, but then I realized this is a huge opportunity. Like no one cares about this stuff right now. Mm. And I'm one of the few people around who's like a new engineer, like who knows, who's like starting to, you know, get to the point where I understand Bitcoin inside and out. And, um, and so it was pretty, you know, it didn't take long to get a, a Bitcoin startup job. Um, and that's that's really how I got my start. Yeah, and I mean, around that time, I mean, I guess all coins are coming out. Uh, yeah. What is your impression of them back then? Yeah, you know, like back then, I, yeah, like I I I, it, I I played around with a lot of different altcoins. Um, you, it was a different time then. Um, mm -hmm. There was something more like authentic about the altcoin, like everything was just fun right mm -hmm. there wasn't serious money really like yeah some people by then then but then had had like gotten rich right. but like by and large like this wasn't like some serious industry like everyone was just kind of like having fun and have like playing with things and so you know like yeah i had like a cripsy account i don't know if anyone you remember cripsy um and, and yeah like we would like and there were all these ideas of like people discovering like what is this stuff going to be good for like right. It was like data coin. It was like a, the first, like there was um, pure coin, the perfect name perfect coin snake idea. Like this guy, Sonny, like ran pure coin. And it was like the first idea. It was the first like time someone thought of proof of stake. Right. Um, and all these ideas back then were like really like cool and interesting to play with. Um, right. And so it, it was like, it was a fascinating time. Um, but like Bitcoin was always king. Right. And that was always clear. Um, and um but, but, but then like, so, you know, eventually like you realize like playing with all the alts, right? Like Bitcoin's really the only thing here that really matters, right? Um, and, um, and so like I had sort of my exposure to, to all that. And then fast forward to like the first ICO bubble of like 2017, I sort of like, I hadn't paid attention to like the ICO stuff much. And I, all of a sudden, I get all these people asking me all these questions about what do you think about this token and this token, people that had never been interested in Bitcoin before. I'm like, what are you asking me this for? Like, what is going on? And, um, and then, you know, like all these people would ask me these random tokens and these pre-sales. And like, I was like, and by then I, had, I was sort of like so far beyond the alt phase that I was like, what on earth is happening here? Like, what are people on about? Like, and I didn't, it took me like a while to be like, like lots of normal people are like jumping into like this now. And, um, and I was like, you know, I've, I've like, I've seen this before. Right. Um, uh, but it was just like to a new order of magnitude. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I saw that happen and right. Like, of course, you know, like almost, most of those people lost a lot of money. Um, this was like post Ethereum. Right. Um, so yeah, you know, and then of course we've had our bubble since then. Um, but th that said, like, you know, I'm not anti-experimentation. Like, look, if you want to create a coin, like go ahead and create it, right? Um, but I just think uh, like that was sort of my wake up call for really seeing like how easy it is to exploit the information asymmetry um, is really what it comes down to, right? Like mm -hmm. the information asymmetry is so exploitable for your economic, for economic gain. Um, then the asymmetry specifically between 
people who really understand what this is, like what, what Bitcoin is, what, the, what this is about, and people totally new to the space who it's really easy to convince them of like lots of things. Um, and uh, that, that, that wasn't really obvious to me uh, that that was like so such a big dynamic until 2017. Right. And it's, I, I bring it up because now we've gone through another four years, maybe five years since 2017, and another almost cycle up in terms of magnitude around these, uh, these games played uh, around altcoins. And I remember when I came in in 2017, uh, honestly, in the beginning, it was, uh, you know, I, I was speculating. I was very interested in this thing that was moving in price. I was learning about the qualities, but I got from both a legacy financial perspective and a technological perspective, enamored with some of these other things, um, learning about them, what they can do. Uh, it's even interesting. I think I was looking at a discussion on Twitter today about how uh, even Satoshi, I think, was involved in Namecoin mm -hmm. and looking at other things that, you know, time chain or blockchain can not technology can do. And the reason I bring that up is because you've chosen to build a Bitcoin only company, a Bitcoin focused company. So I'd love to hear uh, what it's been like building River. How did you set out? Uh, what were you doing right before River? And then how did you set out and build it? Yeah. So, um, so before River, I was uh, at a fund called Polychain Capital. Um, Polychain was like really the first fund to really I mean, the, 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 the irony kind of is like Polychain actually really sort of like professionalized like the token investing paradigm. Um, and they've done, they've been incredibly successful. Um, great, great firm. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, like it's not that like, I believe all tokens are, are worthless and no, like no one should ever do this or should have ever done that. Um, it's like, frankly, like I just really care about Bitcoin. Like I care about the monetary revolution here. Um, I, I, I'm just less interested in, um, you know, financializing up the stack, um, and, um, you know, experimentation with like smart contracts and stuff like cool. Um, that's just not really what I care about that much. Um, I do pay attention to it. Like I'm not clueless. Like I do know what's going on. Um, and some, some, some objectively fascinating stuff is happening. Um, it's just not something I really want to be like building a whole lot. Of. Um, that's not a never thing, but it, it's just sort of like, where does my interest lie? And so this goes back to sort of, um, sort of like the early days of like why I got into this to begin with. Like I always cared about creating a financial institution built natively around a new type of money and creating a new type of bank built on money the government couldn't control. That's what I've been wanting to do for my entire adult life. Um, and so that's why I'm building River and that's why it's Bitcoin only because I'm not building a trading platform for, um, mm. you know, to, to try and compete with Binance and Coinbase. Like there, if you want to do that, there's plenty of other places to do that really well. I care about building a bank that accelerates the adoption of Bitcoin as global as the global reserve currency. And the opportunity I saw um, was that Coinbase was taking a, I, I thought Coinbase was going to do this. Right. I thought mm -hmm. Coinbase was going to build this Bitcoin bank mm -hmm. and Coinbase took a very different tack. Coinbase started adding lots of different assets and building a trading platform. And look, you can, objectively, they've built a very successful company. They built a multi-billion dollar company around this, made insane amounts of money. Objectively, it's successful. I think Brian Armstrong is smart. I think he's a good CEO. But they didn't build what I wanted to see exist, which was this Bitcoin financial institution that spent its resources um, building the products that you could build if you focused exclusively on Bitcoin and pour all your money into building um, Bitcoin native financial products, right? And then, so the question is, okay, like, well, what does that really mean? Like, what does that look like, right? And um, step one for us was actually kind of vanilla, right? It was building a Bitcoin brokerage, like build a solid on-ramp. Um, it's a lot harder than you think, especially back when we started River. Um, accepting a reversible payment rail for an irreversible um, mm. you know, money is like actually a lot of work. Uh, if you don't want to get totally, you know, like go totally bankrupt, right? Um, and so, like getting that right, uh, building the service org around that, um, like you know, getting smart about how to scale that up was step one for us. And we focused on the higher end of the market to really position ourselves as a premier brand. And then we took the next step along our sort of st strategic arc uh, last fall by launching our mining product. So 
like, what does a multi-product Bitcoin financial institution look like? Well, um, we're building that out. First, it was brokerage and really rock solid custody. Then it was, now it's um, mining, managed mining. So we, we make it as easy to uh, mine Bitcoin as we do to buy Bitcoin. It's not, it's not cloud mining. It is um, our clients completely own their hardware. Um, we host it for them. And our clients are, are basically purchasing a Bitcoin cash flow into their account. Right. Um, and you know, there's, that's more of a pillar of products we want to build out over time is other ways to, um, to you know, put capital to work to build these Bitcoin cash flows around mining. Um, and then the, the, the next pillar of financial products, um, and then we have a few more pillars of, 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 of products that we want to build out. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into, you know, share our exact strategy, but um, we have some exciting stuff coming along. Um, you know, we definitely have stuff that we're looking at doing re regarding the Lightning Network. Um, we are one of the biggest Lightning nodes. Um, and I think the Lightning Network really opens the doors to another level of um, very fascinating financial products that, um, that we can offer our clients someday. Uh, and so that's, that's really, you know, like what I mean when I talk about a Bitcoin financial institution. Like we can do all of these things because my engineering team is not um, focused on constantly keeping up with adding the next token um, or supporting the next like ETH fork, right? Like all of that stuff creates an enormous amount of like work and technical debt to keep up with. Um, and we don't have to deal with any of that. Right. Uh, I, I, I agree with everything you said there. And I, I, what I really love about this is the idea of that, of, of a bank building on, on sort of this, uh, a Bitcoin native financial services. Uh, cause I, I, you know, have a finance background and I think banking is great. And I love how you make the distinction between banking and central banking, very different things. Um, so what, what has been the focus for the last, how long has River been around? And, and kind of what has been, uh, what, what are the main uh, functions of, of a Bitcoin bank uh, right now? So we're about three and a half years old. Um, and, you know, to, be, to, to, you know, just for the lawyers, we are not officially a bank. We are not a <laughs> chartered, we're not a chartered federal bank. I'm using the term in a more colloquial sense of the word, how I view ourselves. We don't market ourselves as a bank. Um, you know, if any, uh, if anyone at the, uh, none of this is financial advice. Yeah. None of this <laughs> is financial. Um, that said, right. Like what is a bank in like the traditional sense of the word, right? Like it's a bank. You, you keep your wealth in, right. And they offer, you know, they keep it safe and they offer other services around your wealth to help you mm. build more wealth. And so I view our primary mm. mission as to like our, well, the way we describe ourselves and our strategy is we build high quality accessible financial products to help our clients build their Bitcoin wealth, right? Um, and our mission is to help our clients build their Bitcoin wealth, accumulate more Bitcoin. That's how we view our mission to our clients. And so um, uh, that, that's, that's, our, that's our guiding, like that's our North Star. And um, so, you know, brokerage is the first one, you know, convert cash into convert, you know, your, your income or your cash flow, mm -hmm. Bitcoin, um, V1, uh, buying miners. Acquiring miners, acquiring hash rate, um, like buying Bitcoin cash flows. Uh, that's another way to build your Bitcoin well. Um, it has different risk return profiles. Um, you know, people want different, people want options, right? People want different ways to um, and, and make different trade offs um, to accumulate Bitcoin in different ways. Um, and over time, there will be other ways to either accumulate more Bitcoin or, or uh, you know, one way to help our clients build their Bitcoin wealth is also to give them ways to put it to work without selling it, right? Um, and so this is how we think about our, our roadmap, our strategy, and what we're building out for our clients. We wanna build the best place for people to, to have their Bitcoin. Um, but but you know, that said, we wanna build that financial institution you can trust, but you don't have to, right? The beautiful thing about Bitcoin is our clients mm -hmm. can withdraw their wealth um, you know, whenever they need to, whenever they want to. Having a, we want a big door in and a big door out, right? Having the big door out, um, is a sign of a trustworthy institution, right? If you can leave whenever you want, um, it's a it's a high trust signal, and um, and trust is everything in this industry, right? 
Yeah, I do. It's very interesting around trust too. Uh, what, what do you guys do collateralized loans around Bitcoin? And, and what is your view on, on that? We don't do that. We don't have that product offering right now. Um, that said, um, it's certainly something that, uh, you know, it's not lost to us the value of. Um, we, so, so generally, I think that collateralized lending is a very compelling product. I think that um, there's a higher level concept here, which is not just like, like the vanilla collateralized lending, like click a button, get cash against your Bitcoin. It's more like, what's the higher level need? People want their Bitcoin recognized as, as valuable collateral, right? Um, like you go to a bank, you go to a normal bank today, um, and you tell them, Hey, like, you know, I'd like this sort of loan. Like, I don't have like here, look, I have some substantial wealth. And, and they're like, and, and then they're yeah. like, Oh, then they're like, well, they're like, and you say, Oh, I'm worth, I don't know. Let's say you said I'm worth $10 million. Right. And they're like, Oh, let's talk. This is interesting to us. <laughs> and then, and then you, and then they, they ask for your information. Like, Oh, $10 million is Bitcoin. Oh, ha. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. I thought you had, I thought you were talking about real money. Um, right. and, um, now, ironically, if those $10 million were in Netflix shares, uh, that would have been okay, right? Um, and, and so there, there's an asymmetry here. So there's a, there's a gap in the market. Um, and, and at a higher level, like, um, you know, people, you know, mid, middle to upper end of the market have this substantial wealth in Bitcoin and, and normal financial institutions don't recognize it. Um, and so therefore they can't access the level of financial services that their peers who have their wealth in other assets can't. And that's, that's basically the need that River, it, you know, wants to address over time. Right. Yeah, I, I think collateralized loans are an important financial instrument. Uh, I think that it's important to everyone that understands what they're taking, the risks uh, they're taking. And there's various risks with collateralized loans, whether they are fully reserved, fractionally reserved. Uh, the counterparty risk, not just with who, who you're dealing with, but then the counterparty risk of who you're dealing with is dealing with. And I think all of those can be assuaged and dealt with. And I think you can mitigate and, and figure out your own choices. Um, but what do you think of what's going on uh, right now in terms of the market? Uh, in terms of, I guess, I don't know how to put it, but liquidity or, you know, I think BlockFi sums it up. But, you know, it... it I don't know if the problem there is their collateralized loans. That's not what I'm arguing, but what, but that, that seems to be a main fact, a function of their business model. So what do you think of the contagion in the market and, and Celsius and Luna and, and a lot of this stuff? Yeah. So most of that stuff is nothing that we ever want to get involved with the collateralized lending that, you know, I think we're both talking about is you hold Bitcoin and you hold more Bitcoin than the dollars you lend out against it. And if they don't pay it back, the minute that hits its like margin call, boom, liquidated. It's like basically the safest possible loan in the world, right? Right, uh, seeing collateral. Yeah, exactly. Um, that none of that is the reason this contagion happened, right? Right. right. All like um, uh, all this contagion was due to like uh, under collateralized loans and trust with centralized lenders, like lending to friends or other like you know, corporate friends that they thought they could trust that had like these great sterling reputations. Turns out they were potentially running all these, you know, funky investment schemes. Um, I don't want to call it a Ponzi scheme yet. Like we don't know like exactly what, what went down, but certainly didn't end well. And, um, uh, and I think most people lending to them had no idea how bad it really was. Um, Cause if they did, they almost certainly wouldn't have lent anything. So, um, so basically I think this whole contagion um, was a huge wake-up call for the industry. Um, what what we didn't see was um, the like a lot a lot of the more seasoned financial folks really get wrecked. Um, some did, but like a lot didn't. Like a lot of the like Wall Street sort of um, firms that have started dipping their toes into this um, were very conservative, like the whole time, um, and super risk averse with their loan books. And um, those guys were, were okay, right? Because the thing is like, there is stuff to learn from Wall Street. Like they've been through all this stuff before the last hundred years, right? Like they've seen these things play out. That's why they have the controls in place that they do. Um, and uh, now I'm not calling for more regulation, but like the controls at those firms don't just exist because regulations, because of regulations, they exist because they don't wanna go out of business. Um, and so 
uh, I think what, what like the crypto industry is just like rapidly relearning some of the lessons that Wall Street learned in the last hundred years. Um, and it needed mm. to happen. Um, and like next, so like now, uh, you know, nobody is going to just lend, well, I won't say nobody. It's going to be a lot harder to borrow capital on, under collateralized without having a very, very thorough audit of your financial situation, right? Um, right. And like, no, there's, there's going to be no, no more legit firm is going to be lending um, nine figures uh, on, on reputation, right? Yeah, I, I would hope not. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, but yeah, I, I think there's some lessons learned here. And I think to your point is that some of these lessons have been learned before. It's kind of like uh, some people, you can tell them, don't touch the stove and, and they, they get it. And some people say, well, come on, how hot could it be? You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and and what's, what's interesting is, um, you know, as much as there is a lot of funny business with DeFi, um, this whole contagion thing showed that there's a subset of DeFi that's actually interesting because not a single depositor to, to um, uh, Compound or Aave or any of these collateralized lending protocols that don't trust anybody um, uh, lost anything, right? Um, they, it's ruthless, right? You either put up all the collateral or you don't. Um, and if you hit your, you know, your liquidation limit, you ruthlessly get, get wrecked and, and every depositor is protected. So it's kind of funny, like the centralized companies are the, the, the depositors at like the centralized firms like Celsius mm -hmm. are the ones that got wiped out. But the depositors and DeFi protocols actually didn't. Um, the collateralized lending protocols, like Luna, right. all that stuff, another. Right. Which I think is a, a whole other level of technical ability to kind of deal with. So I don't think that was, I think that was maybe the smarter retail money or not the dumb money. Right. And not the majority of the money. Um, I'm wondering with, you know, being a Bitcoin only company and everything that's going on right now. Um, do you think like it's harder, do, do you, is it a harder for you to get credibility as, as a company, as a Bitcoin only company? Do you think you'd have more credibility in, in sort of this dumber money space and, and not all of it's dumb money, but in wall street money, Silicon Valley money, who's tend to, you know, maybe like the technology side of these things and, and the being able to whatever you want to call it, but do you think you lose credibility or would have more credibility in, in some other facet? Is it harder being a Bitcoin only company in that regard? Definitely. Um, short term would have more credibility. Long right. term. That's yeah. Would have less. That, right. You said, I, I, yeah. I mean, a phrase you may run off is selling out or whatever, but you, you it's, I, I would imagine like when you're dealing with some people that you, whether you're raising funds or, or even just, like you were mentioning, getting even just maybe banking services uh, and dealing with the legacy system is probably harder as a Bitcoin only company. Were there major um, hurdles in that regard? Maybe I, you see that a lot in other that, industries. Like that, that difficulty is just, I would say, like just being crypto, like when we started, right? It wouldn't have been easier for us to get a bank account if we also supported Ethereum. Um, um, but really that like the difficulty is like, um, the, the mainstream narrative is so multi-coin is so crypto, um, that, you know, that it certainly is a, um, a, a headwind, but really at the end of the day, um, you know, like I said, our product strategy is build financial products that help people accumulate Bitcoin. Right. So at the end of the day, the bet is lots of people are going to want better ways to get more Bitcoin. And if we can effectively execute on that strategy, it doesn't really matter. Like it, the way I think about it is like, um, uh, if, if like that, like for more and more people every year, Bitcoin is their unit of account. It's, it's how they measure their wealth, right? And we wanna help those people um, uh, build their wealth. And that the, the, the number of those people will keep growing every year. Um, I deeply believe that we're right, that like Bitcoin is really like the one true money out of all this stuff. And if that, if that theory is right, then, then we're on the right trajectory. It doesn't mean altcoins won't exist. I just see altcoins as a totally different category. of Yeah, I agree. Stocks. It's like, why, like the, the, the same reason I wouldn't, 
like when people say like, why don't you add like altcoin trading to river? I'm like, well, I mean, I can use the same argument for adding stock trading, right? Like right. it's just not what we do. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think it really helps on the back end with engineering and security. Uh, and I, I mean, I have a lot of, uh, ill will for my experience on Coinbase in 2017 because of the way they positioned other, what could have been anything. And there are things that are not like Bitcoin, but I, I, in that regard, I saw them as being uh, equal or, or on the same playing field. And I thought a lot about diversification and I thought a lot about uh, I, I, a unit bias fell in. Well, I can't buy a whole Bitcoin, but I could buy a whole other Litecoin or, you know, and, and then actually then I fell with the, the bull run then. Uh, so, you know, I was like, oh, I'm on to something here. Um, Oh, I lost my train of thought there, but so, oh, uh, I want to know um, how you came up with the name River. Uh, I think it's, I mean, I think it's brilliant. Um, well, it wasn't some stroke of genius. Um, the story is a little bit less sexy. Um, uh, basically, um, we were originally called, we originally had a different name. It's called Alto Financial. And our domain was alto.financial. It's kind of crappy domain name. Um, and, and we got a cease and desist letter telling us uh, we had to change our name or we were going to get sued. And we were a small company and didn't want to deal with it. And also we weren't in love with our name anyways. So we were like, let's just bite the bullet. And we worked with this domain consultant who actually was great um, because what he did was um, he wasn't just like a domain broker. He was like, I'll help you find a name with a dot com. With a dot com. And so... Um, Cause that was like, if we were going to, if we we're going to rechange our name, we're, we're going to get the damn.com. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so we went through this exercise of like multiple iterations of like, you know, what kind of brand do you want? Here's some different names. And then like one, in one of those iterations, I was like, wait, river.com is available. Like, you know, there's no way we can afford this, but let's just see what it costs. Because I had looked at other names. Like, I think it was like atlas.com and it was like, mm wanted like 10 million dollars or something like ridiculous and where i was like so i just assumed like river.com would be like but it wasn't and um it was a price that it wasn't cheap by any means but also wouldn't break the bank and i had known from a previous startup that i helped get off the ground that getting the dot com you love is absolutely worth it like a hundred percent so i didn't have any so i knew i knew immediately like this was the name um once we sort of got the trademark sort of sign off from our lawyers and um and that yeah the rest is history right uh what was the well i won't ask about the other startup but uh what how what did you what have you guys been doing in terms of lightning and uh, i'd love to hear your take on the lightning network yeah so i am very excited about the lightning network um we have a team of four very talented engineers um focused full-time on our lightning infrastructure and uh, the future of lightning at River. Um, yeah, there's, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts on lightning. So um, I think lightning is a very powerful long-term, um, uh, it's gonna be very, very powerful long-term um, for, for really truly making Bitcoin a global currency. Um, the, the lightning network is truly what's necessary if Bitcoin is going to scale as a global currency. That said, I think that's like end vision, right? Um, it's going to be a long time before Bitcoin is a compelling medium of exchange in the, develop, in the developed world. Um, we still have the dollar for the foreseeable future. The dollar is gonna be a great medium of exchange. Um, and uh, you know, I think that anyone who says otherwise is just totally in denial, right? Like we all buy stuff with dollars, it works pretty well. Um, and um, so what I'm excited about actually is, is Taro. Um, Taro is the um, asset protocol uh, that Lightning Lab developed. Lightning Labs has developed um, to issue assets on Bitcoin, uh, similar to colored coins, but sort of but using Taproot and really, you know, sort of next generation, sort of all the learnings over the last, um, you know, five or 10 years. And um, Taro allows these assets to be also transacted in the Lightning Network. And that's going to open up the Lightning Network to a whole nother 
um, uh, it's going to open up a whole new level number of like degrees of freedom on the Lightning Network, um, where where other assets beyond Bitcoin can transact. Um, and because the Lightning Network is great for transacting, right? It's great for transacting. But the thing is, like, um, you know, commerce is just still not done with Bitcoin, right? Like, yes, there are in some place in some places in the developing world we're seeing that grow and grow. And I really, uh, and I think that trend will continue in the developing world for sure. Um, but I think really like, if you talk to most people in the developing world, they also just still kind of want dollars. Um, and so um, dollars on lightning is actually really interesting because the, the way that this can work is you don't even need, with the lightning network, you need these payment channels between all the parties so that you can transact in Bitcoin. Well, with Taro, um, let's say I wanted to pay you in um, a stable coin on Taro or sorry, on Lightning, right? Um, I actually don't need a path to you for that stable coin, right? Um, as long as I have a stable coin path to a node and there's a Bitcoin path to a, an, an, a gateway node that has a, has a stable coin path to you, I can pay you in, um, in dollars or the currency of your choice. Right. Uh, but, it, but the transaction is being routed through the Bitcoin native Lightning Network. Um, so Bitcoin is almost fulfilling like this vision here that Ripple wanted to do, wanted to have, mm -hmm. right? Um, where like Bitcoin is the, the there's this the network rails. And, and just the edges, um, there's this like, uh, you know, there's this like reserve currency and, and the, at the edges you convert um, the currency of choice of the transactor or the, or the, or the sender or the receiver. Um, and I'm really interested, interesting in like the world that like all of this, all of the stuff that that unlocks. Um, I think it's, I think there's, there's the devil's in the details. There's a lot left to build. Like, we don't know exactly, you know, what, what this looks like. Um, there, there's a lot left to figure out. The engineering is just really beginning here. Um, but I think it's a very interesting and compelling um, future. Right. A lot of what you said there made me think though of like liquid and atomic swaps and and even i guess what what they're doing over at strike it's is it ever for you uh hard to focus on just river uh i'm you know in terms of uh i mean there's just so many exciting areas to working in bitcoin and 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 with your mind i mean you, you know um and, and maybe yeah well my job is to pay attention to all the cool stuff happening so that we can figure out how to, so we can, I can see where the puck's going and figure out how to best take advantage of that for River clients. Now, what I, what I haven't talked about, and I don't want to get into too much because a lot of this is still sort of internal and, and secret, um, is like all that I just said, right? How does that help River users, right? Mm -hmm. And how does that help us build financial products for River clients? Um, I'm mm -hmm. not going to like, I don't want to dig mm -hmm. into that, but like, that's the context that like, I care about this stuff in. Um, and um, uh, so, so, you know, it, it, it isn't a distraction. It's actually really like, um, a, you know, a big pillar. Yeah, of our I see what you're saying. We're one of the biggest lightning nodes in the network. Right. Right. Because I'm skating to where the puck's going. What did you think of Facebook and Libra and their attempt at rolling out a token or a network or whatever you want to call it. I think one of my most controversial opinions, especially in the Bitcoin industry, and probably honestly, like in any, in any group of people, regardless of political affiliation, um, is uh, I think Mark Zuckerberg is a great CEO. Um, uh, no one's perfect. I actually, I think he's a great CEO. Um, and uh, I think Libra, um, was a very inspired vision. I think it was a very cool idea of Facebook, this online world um, and ecosystem having their own currency. Now, the reality is it was probably over-engineered, right? They like went full down sort of like the, the crypto, they, they, they tried to get too crypto as opposed to like really solving for like the user, like what are the right. problems they're trying to solve here? Um, but I, I think by and large, like the real, um, the real, and, and arguably they should have just used Bitcoin, right? Or, or some stable existing like, or Tether or USDC. But really the regulators at the end of the day, like 
made it dead on arrival. Right? Yeah. But the I, social capital or the political capital to be able to let the like Congress just saw this and was like, no. Yeah, I think I, I just thought the one thing there is they trying to do their own sort of unit versus what I think at uh, a choice, not well, not in terms of ranked order, but in worst to best would be just do a basket of currencies. I think their their best bet would have been just do a synthetic dollar or sort of like a, their Facebook dollar, like the euro dollar, and just have a dollar backed thing. And I think that would have been a great way for the United States then to uh, use the monetary uh, colonists and, and sort of export the dollar to Facebook users outside the country. And then Facebook would have had the chance to serve their users, uh, sort of build this huge network for the dollar. And then they could always down the road change the game when they had more political currency and, and stronger rails. I, I think that was the only way they misplayed that. Uh, consider it's very interesting what you said about Zuckerberg. I mean, I, yeah, I think he's, you, I mean, in terms of a, a, a public company, he's done a, a splendid job of, of growing that company into a behemoth. And I don't use that word in a negative way, but uh, yeah, he's, um, and not many CEOs get to do it from that age and for that long. I wonder then, what do you think of Zuckerberg as a CEO compared to say uh, the, the, the Winklevoss twins? in terms of you know and they were kind of around the beginning of facebook mm -hmm. social media and then have gone on to another billion dollar idea with both bitcoin and and probably even a third billion dollar idea with crypto with if they've made a billion off of gemini um so look i mean they're extremely successful in their own right um i don't know them um and you know, I, don't, I wouldn't, wouldn't say anything bad about them. They, they, they've been extremely successful. Um, that said, you know, I, I don't think it's like controversial to say like objectively, you know, Zuckerberg is like a true like founder CEO, right? The Winklevoss mm. twins are, are, you know, I'm not, it's not obvious like how involved they are in Gemini. Like, mm. like they're cert very clearly very sharp. They're like great at building wealth and, and um, have built, you know, a, a good company in Gemini. Um, um, but, 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 you know, Zuckerberg is in a league sort of, of, of like really like great CEOs um, who've truly built like a world changing company. I wouldn't say Gemini is a world changing company. Right. Um, and that's just, I, I mean, I, I consider that not even to be controversial. It's just objectively true. Um, and I, I think like, you know, just as a CEO, just seeing sort of like everything that that company has been through he's led the, he's like steered the ship the whole way um always with generally with confidence um i don't know i kind of admire it yeah no i mean i, I get what you're saying that's why i wanted to hear uh, a little bit more um i know you have uh, a strong interest in history so wh where do you think we are in terms of the history of money right now yeah you know um, I have no idea. Um, it's a very chaotic thing. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't have the sort of, sort of my, I guess, sort of part of the reason I, I, I believe so much in Bitcoin is, is because of sort of what, what Friedrich Hayek calls the fatal conceit, like, you know, that any, any single party can actually like truly understand what's going on and steer society, uh, in an optimal direction. So, um, but that said, um, I think we're, probably entering a new era here. Like the world order is shifting. Um, I don't think the dollar is ending tomorrow. Um, I, the dollar is like, I mean, like fiat currencies, it's like a relative game, right? Um, like the dollar is still stronger than every other world currency, even, even given the, lot, the inflation that we've seen. And the, the, the central bank, as painful as it might be to the economy, seems willing to tighten things up. Um, and which is probably what needed to happen. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, so like, you know, I think the dollar still got along a, a, a while to go. Um, I don't know how, I don't know if that's 10 years. I don't know if that's 50 years. Um, I don't know where that goes. I do think like, it's possible that we see, um, 
I do, but I do think Bitcoin is going to continue on a trajectory to become the reserve currency of the world, to become this pristine collateral. It's possible there's a world where, where Bitcoin is truly the reserve asset, but it's still not the unit of account or like the, but it, it's backing things, right? It's, right? it's really sort of like underlying lots of other currencies. Um, it's also possible that what we see is actually like a, 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 a transition, a peaceful transition um, over time, um, countries just start to embrace it and use it as a base money. Um, I honestly don't know. All I feel confident in is that Bitcoin will continue on its current trajectory of growth. And I don't know exactly how that plays out geopolitically or with central banks. Right. Is Bitcoin a, an American I ideal? I think it is. I think it's, it's, it's freedom money. It's property rights and try. It's like, um, it's, it's property rights that by and large, like cannot be trampled on, right? Um, it, it's the most like, it's the cheapest property rights to enforce to, have, to ever exist, right? Like, you know, we like to say you have a, a right to your life, liberty and property, but in, even that is sort of at odds with the concept of freedom, right? Because like, well, who's gonna defend it for you, right? Like someone's gotta defend your land, like you're gonna pay the military, like, like the military just served you. you, you know, like what gives you that, right? So there's that whole like rabbit hole, right? Um, but Bitcoin's like this property right that like, it's just mathematical, right? Um, there's not an army. Um, there's no, you know, you're paying for it by just like paying transaction fees and through some inflation. Um, and so it's almost like truly like the a right to property that doesn't force anyone else to do anything for you. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's what I love about it too. Um, so in terms of like Bitcoin being a monetary revolution, do you think um, this takes 50 to 100 years? And, and I wonder in sense of, because I see a world too where Bitcoin might just back things as a strategic reserve. And I, then I don't think it sort of permeates into culture uh, as much in society and, and uh, economics in, in terms of maybe household economics, corporate economics as much in, in that regard. Yeah, you know, I, I, I honestly have no idea in the, time, in the timeline. Um, I think it's, it, it's anyone's guess. There's so many things, unexpected things that can happen to either accelerate or delay that timeline. Um, I would argue COVID accelerated it. Um, mm -hmm. not COVID, but the response to COVID accelerator. Right. Um, uh, who knows what's next, right? Um, who knows what the next thing is? Uh, you know, this is sort of like a weird tangent, but like, I would say like one of my, I have this like weird suspicion and I could be like totally wrong. Um, but my weird, like, um, why no one else talks about this kind of thing that I think could happen this century is um, Japan really sort of like rises again. Um, uh, it's not something, I think it's like a pretty like out there like opinion, but like I could totally see like with the rise of China, um, like nationalism in Japan, like sort of sparking something in like the, the, that culture, which is still very homogenous. And it like, it, it, like it's the same culture that was there hundred years ago. Like they didn't, the people didn't change. Um, and so, um, you know, like, like who knows, like these kinds of things, right? Like if China invades Taiwan, like, well, the only other islands left are starting to get much closer. Like, like, so, um, and so who knows what that could mean for the world, right? And right. Um, again, like, like, I'm not, I don't know how this relates to Bitcoin exactly, but like, <clears throat> Maybe it's not Japan. Maybe it's some other country, and, and, and just something. But there's going to be something that no one saw coming, that like happens here. Um, and who knows what that precipitates? Yeah, I, I mean that's a really interesting example of of externalities that can can change the game. I think inflation is one of those things. Hyperinflation. <laughs> I think if we have hyperinflation, I think that that sort of uh, changes the way we think about the dollar as a unit of account, or I'd, 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 I'd hope it inspire people to, uh, I start, I'm starting to feel like 10% inflation is getting normalized. 
and, and even I see it even in myself. Uh, I, I just went by the uh, the gas station the other day, and it was down to four four dollars and forty cents. And I was like, oh, it's kind of cheap now, <laughs> you know. And I've been sort of uh, the overton window has been moved, and what in terms I will now accept. And and what that said to me right then and there was, I was like, oh wow, like it's gonna hit six bucks, seven, eight bucks, and and I'll I'll be okay with it because I'm now used to this volatility, this fluctuation around this commodity. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I, I think it would take like 30, 40% inflation in the dollar. And, and I think to your points, I, I don't think we're anywhere near that. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of been a little bit of a theme lately is just how long can things continue as is outside of the Bitcoin overlay, uh, you know, and, and I'm starting to think that could, you know, in terms of the way that Bitcoin humbles you, um, I, I think that it, it could take a lot longer in that regard. Um, has Bitcoin changed you? Uh, well, you know, it seems like Bitcoin's right up your alley in terms of, you know, aerospace engineer, technology, uh, monetary freedom, uh, banking. Uh, has it changed you in any way? I'm sure it has. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's given me a lot of new friends. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's been sort of the guiding light on this journey of starting a company, which has changed me tremendously. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's an extremely humbling um, experience, um, you know, trying to build something uh, from the ground up. Um, overall, I mean, I would say yes. I would say, you know, it's really, it's given me, I feel blessed. Like I have a reason to like wake up and work hard every day. Um, that's like bigger than me, right? Or bigger than my immediate family or um, it's, it's, it's bigger than sort of just like my daily life, right? Um, and I have like a true thing, like I, I believe in it and can work on. And, and a lot of people don't have that in their careers. Um, and having that, I think has certainly contributed to um, where I am today and just feeling a, tremendous level of fulfillment in what I do. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that sentiment a lot. It's not the reason I do the show. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation, Alex. Uh, it's been an awesome. Uh, River, you know, I've been a client, a customer. I don't know what the word is. Uh, I guess it's customer for, for a couple of years now. And I, I really appreciate uh, what you guys offer in the space because I can recommend River. It, it's Bitcoin only. What that means to me is uh, I'm not going to confuse anybody uh, when I send them there and they're going to get the highest service in terms of security uh, and, and focus on uh, the thing that we're trying to uh, acquire at that point and, and the brokerage services to what you're talking about. And I'd love to see where you guys grow. Uh, I'm really excited about the mining aspect of things. Um, I, I really like how you kind of, I think it was kind of how you phrased it around Bitcoin cash flows, but helping your clients, customers, users uh, increase their Bitcoin wealth in various ways, I think is a really uh, fascinating way to look at it. So this has been so awesome. Thank you so much. I'll leave it to you for any parting words and to let people know where they can find you. Uh, and obviously it's river.com, but you know, anything else you want to share about River? Thanks, Cedric. Yeah, it was, it was great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, you can find me on, on Twitter at, at Leishman, um, L-E-I-S-H-M-A-N, uh, river.com. Um, pay attention. We'll be launching some cool stuff in the weeks and months to come. And uh, yeah, you know, we work hard every day to, to help you build your Bitcoin wealth. So if that's something you care about, um, having a River account is, is uh, something you want to have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Good